we're talking the gospel according to Psalms 76. Psalm 76. Let us read the word of God, first of all. Psalm 76. In Judah is God known, his name is great in Israel. In Salem also is his tabernacle, and his dwelling place in Zion. There break he the arrows of the bow, the shield, and the sword, and the battle, Selah. Thou art more glorious and excellent than the mountains of prey. The stout-hearted are spoiled, they have slept their sleep, and none of the men of might have found their hands. At thy rebuke, O God of Jacob, both the chariot and horse are cast into a deep, deep, a dead sleep. Thou, even thou, art to be feared, and who may stand in thy sight when once thou art angry? Thou didst cause judgment to be heard from heaven. The earth feared and was still when God rose to judgment to save all the meek of the earth. Selah. Surely the wrath of God shall praise thee, the remainder of wrath shall thou restrain. Vow and pay unto the Lord your God. Let all that be round about him bring presents unto him that ought to be feared. He shall cut off the spirit of princes. He is terrible to the kings of the earth. In this psalm we have... Um, the sum and substance of the gospel, even some eschatological points that uh, speak of the end of times. So the first coming of Christ is, um, of course, uh, pictured here, prophesied rather, but also the second coming, when he subdue all the nations and he shall be terrible to the princes thereof and so on. But let us... Um, observe some of the uh, more salient features especially the very first verse of this psalm which says in judah is god known his name is great in israel now the word judah signifies praise as uh, most of you know probably so judah means praise it is also one of the tribes of israel and um, if you read the old testament judah is uh, the allocation, first of all, Judah was the tribe selected by the Lord from which the Savior came, Jesus Christ, as prophesied of all, the line of the tribe of Judah, and also uh, geographically in the confines of the allotment given to the tribe of Judah and Benjamin was the uh, most holy place, the um, the beautiful foundation, the Mount Zion, the temple worship, and basically the center of all life in Israel because of the presence of God, the Lord, in uh, Jerusalem. So when it says, in Judah is God known, there's a couple of points to be made. Judah, as we can... Uh, also, you know, make references and uh, connections to, to, to this day signifies the church because Judah means praise and says God is in the midst of her and in Judah is God known. Um, safely, we may uh, picture church because that's primarily the function of the church to know God and uh, to show forth his praises, to set forth his praises. That's the essence of the church, to glorify God. As one of the older confessions says, what is the chief end of man is to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. And that is to praise him continuously. That is the function of the church. So that's the setting of the psalm. In Judah is God known. Um... But he was known, if we study the uh, sacred history in the Old Testament, primarily through types and shadows and the rites, institutions of the Old Covenant, uh, different washings and uh, ablutions and ceremonies and offerings and such. So it was still not completely open. 
So when it says, in Judah is God known, uh, the Lord was known, and the fame of him indeed um, was, you know, a fair a sounding far abroad of the confines of Judah, but nevertheless, not everybody out of the old administration, out of the old um, dispensation, actually knew God in his fullness, as for, he, for who he is. See, it's, it's interesting that here we have, um, again, a case of Hebrew parallelism, where the, the same thing is stated twice in the passage, in the first part of verse 1, and Judah is God known, and his name is great in Israel. So when you know God, of course, his name appears and is treated as great, as holy, as sacred, as mighty, as almighty. And the name represents the reality of um, the one who is called by, by that name. God is revealing himself throughout the church history, I mean the sacred history, through different names. And the most uh, magnificent and indeed sacred and somewhat mysterious is the name Lord, which is with a capital L O and R and D, which is the um, Hebrew name Jehovah, which is translated means I am that I am, or I am who I am, and a self existent God who is forever, who has all existence in himself. He does not depend on any creature, he does not need any creature. He is self-sufficient, okay? And this God, no one can know him unless he, he be pleased to reveal himself and make his name and therefore his attributes and perfections known unto man. That's what he actually did. He went public and disclosed his name to the patriarchs and finally the fullest revelation of him is in the face of his glorious son Jesus Christ so in Judah is God known but let us consider what it means that God is known what it is to know God and of course we can read books and uh, hear lectures and sermons about God and his attributes and perfections and uh, and so many things and you know and books and volumes and have been published uh, by man, uh, by all sorts of religions, about God, what he is or could be according to our imaginations and so forth. So what is the knowledge of God? Well, he's not a theory. He's not a formula. Uh, there is a great deal of secrecy about, I mean, the mystery of God because he is the uh, someone and one might even say something as an entity that is hard to be described let alone full exhausted in explanation otherwise he wouldn't be God and then the, even the ancients understood that to whom will you like me say the Lord repeatedly in the history so how do you know how do you get to know God and it's interesting that the knowledge is um, not so much bookish or uh, theoretical but uh, it is by experience and it is particularly related to the gospel the knowledge of what let us go to one of the uh, more well-known passages it is the prophecy of the coming new covenant in Jeremiah 31 it is a very well-known oft quoted in the book of Hebrews repeatedly about the coming age of the establishment of the new covenant that there will be a new covenant I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah we're not going to read the whole passage but especially verse 34 note this and they i.e. the house of Israel the house of Judah all those whom I will uh, in whose uh, hearts I will put my laws and so on and they shall teach no more every man his neighbor and every 
man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them unto the greatest of them, saith the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. So there's a connection between knowledge and knowledge or learning of the forgiveness of sins, which is presented to us in the gospel. Okay. So uh, it says, they shall all know me. They're not going to teach every man his neighbor and every man his brother saying, know the Lord. Though unless what we should say in connection with this uh, injunction in the, uh, the, the, the prophecy, sometimes people take this too far uh, to suggest that out of the new covenant, and especially the prayer of Baptist and the Baptist bride uh, people, those who elevate uh, this prophecy uh, to the point that uh, they say, well, the church under the, New Test under the New Covenant is so pure, it's all, uh, everybody knows the Lord intimately and savingly in the gospel way, so that there are no, uh, it's just pure wheat and no tares, all good fish and no bad fish, all right, no reprobates, only the elect, everybody's pure, the churches are pure and so forth. Well, that's an idealistic picture earthly representations of the assemblies of uh, God's people everywhere have some contamination and uh, we want to be realistic and we all know uh, oodles of stories of people who profess the name to baptism and vows or some were even in the position of elders and then they went away they went astray finally uh, left uh, for whatever reason and um, and there are many stories where people never come back. So they uh, either, if you're an Armenian, they lost their salvation, they'll say, or those who are of a Calvinistic or gospel persuasion, they went out from us, there, but they were not all of us. For had they been of us, they would have continued with us. But since they went out, and it was made manifest that they were not all of us, as says John in his first epistle. This is not verbatim, but... Uh, you get um, the uh, point that those who leave churches or the assemblies uh, prove themselves to be not of us. But um, the point is that there's still people who don't know the Lord. So this statement that they shall all know me from the least of them unto the greatest is not to be stretched unduly or um, in defiance of other pertinent scriptures which speak on the subject of that uh, not all branches for instance John 15 remain on the vine some are cut off and uh, in judgment and churches do disappear and sometimes they get disbanded and so forth and uh, scandalized we all know by experience that uh, churches are not that pure okay but the point is that relatively speaking if you compare the Old Testament the Old Covenant administration or the uh, dispensation if, if you might call it, the Old Covenant okay since the God's presence was in types and shadows and all of those rites uh, was still very obscure in all those pictures the stone made of te uh, the t temple made of stones magnificent beautiful gorgeous but nevertheless was a typical temple it still had to be a very strict way to approach it in a very minutia very precise way commanded by the Lord to Moses on the mountain. See that you do according to what's been shown to thee on the mount. So everything had to be very specific. Only special, specially chosen people from the special tribe and the dynasty uh, were to be uh, serving as priests. And we all know the Aaronic uh, line according to the order of uh, Aaron people were serving as priests and high priests were selected 
and so on, and the, all of the offerings, thereby the whole uh, administration of that um, covenant was showing that the full access, okay, was not yet disclosed to the people. The veil was not yet rain and twain, was not torn, it was still covered. The Holy of Holies, you could not enter it. Only the high priest, only once a year, with the blood of bulls and goats, according to a careful and meticulous prescription, he had to do it according to the ladder of the law. So that was a very strict uh, way of approaching. So, and many people in Judah or elsewhere in Israel as a whole did not, in fact, know the Lord. He was not revealing himself as clearly as in the mystery of the gospel. The fullness thereof, even though we have the gospel in the entirety of scripture from the beginning to the end, yet the most clear, most perspicuous, and the brightest um, revelation of it is in the face and the ministry, death and resurrection of Jesus Christ and subsequently his apostles who explain to us what it actually meant that he died for our sins according to scriptures and so on. Prior to that, even the prophets uh, actually were eager to look into these things and they were baffled sometimes and try to figure out what was going on, how it's all going to happen, as Peter says in his first epistle. So it was not crystal clear. And many people didn't know the Lord, especially as it relates to the gospel. See, they all know me from the list of them unto the greatest of them, say the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity. Their knowledge of him is intimately connected with their forgiveness of sins, which they also you must know it. Know from where? From the gospel. Now, the gospel itself, even though it is prophesied in the law and by the law, it has a different source. <coughs> Excuse me. The gospel itself comes not by the law, but it is revealed by the faithfulness of Jesus Christ. It is taught by the Holy Spirit. See? That's why people can read the law and only see the commandments, the law. If you've been redeemed and given a new heart, you read Moses not with a veiled face, with a veil color in your face, as, uh, as Paul says, but you see clearly that Christ is there. He is prophesied there, but otherwise it's just commandments, rituals, statutes, and all those things. It's just the law and no gospel. So, But it has to be revealed. This knowledge is given not to everybody, as we know. No one knoweth the Father save the Son. And uh, as it, uh, let's, uh, let's go there, we're... Uh, Jesus explicitly says that no one knows the Father except the Son and to whomever he wills to reveal him. All right. So this is in, the, for instance, this is not the only place, but in, in Matthew, in Matthew 11, verse 27 Jesus says, all things are delivered unto me of my Father, and no man knoweth the Son but the Father. Neither knoweth any man the Father save the Son, and he to whomsoever the Son will reveal him. So it is by revelation. And God is totally sovereign over this. It is a complete and double predestination early in the context. Jesus is actually praising the Father for his hiding 
the true identity of Christ and the gospel, the mysteries of the kingdom, from the wise and prudent. So God actually concealed those things. Thou hast hid those things from the wise and prudent. It is the judicial and sovereign blinding and hardening of the hearts of those uh, people who thought they were religious and in the know, but in fact they didn't know a thing as far as the spiritual uh, content of um, God's revelation. So, so no one knows the Father except the Son, and to whomsoever he, uh, God, uh, the Son will reveal him. So it is completely sovereign, it, but it is the gospel knowledge. This is what the point that I'm uh, laboring. And um, if we go back to Psalm 76, um, it says, In Judah is God known. We might also say he ought to be known in Judah. Church is the place or the community. You might even say a location. When people come to a church. Of course, the geography doesn't mean anything nowadays, but it is the word there are two or three gathered in my name, there am I in their midst. The presence of God was in Judah under the old covenant. The presence of the Lord is now among believers in their assemblies, i.e. churches. So God, and I would say, better be known. But sometimes that's not the case. It wasn't always the case in, in, in Israel, as we all know, um, especially in the times of the uh, um, judges. There was a particularly dark period of uh, sacred history, but also in uh, times of the divided kingdom, when Judah remained, I mean, there was just the tribe of Judah and Benjamin, and the rest of Israel went their own way. And we, as we know, Jeroboam uh, built partisan, separate, unlawful, illicit places of worship for political reasons. Because he thought that, uh, boy, if they're going to continue to send them to uh, Jerusalem for uh, stipulated times of uh, Israel feasts according to the law, then they're going to abandon me and my kingdom. Therefore, he set up those idols in Dan and Beersheba. And therefore, Israel went completely astray with their, even their outward worship. But in Judah, it wasn't much better in point of fact. As well, now in Jeremiah, the prophet laments the condition of Jerusalem. That they say, well, the temple of the Lord, the temple. Remember, he says, don't say it the temple of the Lord, because they thought, because they had that, uh, um, you know, stipulated presence of God in the temple, therefore they were good. Okay, we have God in our midst, but uh, not many people knew God. So, in a sense, in Judah... It's not always God known. God is not always known in Judah. But that is kind of a prophecy. It is to be understood as the prophecy, as the statement of the church as such, as a church of the elect of God, truly redeemed, enlightened by the Spirit of God to see clearly, to understand God's forgiveness of sins in the face and, and work of uh, his dear son, Jesus Christ. That, uh, we know him when he forgives our sins. We actually know him as the God of love because God is love and so on. So in Judah is God known. His name is great in Israel. All those things are true only in the true church, which again, uh, as far as the earthly manifestations, uh, true churches, we still have uh, infirmities and sins and un sometimes unconverted elders, unconverted members, and so so it's not uh, always that uh, apparent that uh, that God is really known 
and Judah. Lamentably so. So it is actually a call to, elder, to the elders, pastors, that we need to make sure that this prophecy is being fulfilled among us, that Ben Judah is God known, and his name is truly great. If he's known as the forgiving God, because that's the main thing that we're justified by the faithfulness of Jesus Christ, by his blood, by his grace, no efforts, no contribution on our part, completely gratuitous, completely gracious. If we know it, then his name is great or should be great among us as well and there's another thing i can't go into all of the uh psalm i did that in our uh, little um we had more time on on sunday to uh, expound this the psalm and i showed different uh, uh things from uh this psalm but just uh i want to show you in verse two uh there's an interesting thing that i oftentimes in times past i've overlooked concerning this uh, designation this uh, name of the place Salem see it says in Salem also is his tabernacle and his dwelling place in Zion see that in verse 2 now Salem is only mentioned twice in the Bible as far as I know and uh, it's actually the place that is rather obscure because uh, it is actually the place well first of all uh, signification of that uh, name Salem is peace and it is the precursor of Jerusalem, but Salem is associated in the Bible with Melchizedek, this highly mysterious figure who appears in Genesis 14, who comes out out of nowhere without the father or mother genealogy, as uh, says Paul in Hebrews 7. He appears likened to the Son of God, having neither the beginning of days nor uh, nor end of life well that is not to be taken literally Melchizedek did have a father and a mother he was not virgin at birth uh, as Christ and he's not the son of God but he is a type which Melchizedek we don't know anything about him he just appears and he blesses Abraham and he Paul also argues that uh, the lesser is blessed by the greater therefore since uh, Melchizedek the king of Salem and also the high priest of the Most High God again combining two things in himself uh, simultaneously being a king and the high priest just as our Lord Jesus Christ and he blesses Abraham who had the promises and therefore Paul argues from that that this Melchizedek this highly mysterious figure serves as a type of Christ who comes also as the king of peace and our high priest but not after the order of Aaron because he was not clearly from uh, uh, from the loins of Aaron in point of fact Aaron wasn't yet born even Levi gave the tithe as Paul says in um, in Hebrews 7 through Abraham because Abraham gave uh, the tenth part of all the spoils to um, Melchizedek this mysterious uh, king and high priest but he's uh, connected to this place Salem so it says in Salem also is his tabernacle and his dwelling place in Zion well it says in tabernacle didn't actually stay in Salem at that covenant of redemption precedes even historically the letter given of the law and therefore the mosaic dispensation so salem see salem is associated with melchizedek now melchizedek precedes aaronic priesthood right but aaron comes later as the law given of the law and everything in the mosaic covenant and then at the end of it appears Christ who is the fulfillment of the prophecy of Melchizedek thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek not Aaron so but it's interesting that Salem appears first and then Zion and of course it's perfected and established in Christ just just a minor point but nevertheless very evangelical very very Christological and pointing to 
our great Savior Jesus Christ. So, in Judah is God known. May He be known among us as the God, as the forgiving God, as justifying the ungodly through the faithfulness of Jesus Christ. To Him be glory both now and forevermore. Amen.